Good evening. Welcome. My name is Andy Mortieri, Headmaster at Kincaid. Thank you so much for coming to tonight's program. I'm so pleased that you are here to uh, be with us to hear from Dr. Temkin. Dr. Temkin this morning um, was wearing a, a t-shirt uh, with the upper school students and he said that that was one of the great things about being a philosopher is that you can wear a t-shirt. So I thought that you should know that, I, that I'm wearing a, a coat and tie uh, not only because it's an important night, but because I'm contractually obligated to wear a coat and tie at school events. Uh, that's a joke. That's a joke. But, uh, anyway, um, when I was growing up, I had the privilege of, of having some, some really outstanding teachers uh, at, at Calvin School and Gilman School in Baltimore, where, where I went to um, uh, pre-K to 12. And they really helped uh, shape who I am today. And Kincaid has been uh, fortunate to have uh, some of those really special educators who've had in that similar influence on students here since 1906. And Mr. Moss was one of those very special people, a prominent part of the life at Kincaid for over 40 years until he passed away in 2005. Many Kincaid alumni have shared what a significant impact he had on them in English class and philosophy class as a debate coach, even as upper school principal. They shared stories about his booming voice, his ability to inspire critical thinking, and how he taught them to speak effectively and to write convincingly. To honor Mr. Moss's legacy, his former students and colleagues created the Moss Fellowship Distinguished Speaker Series. As some of you know, earlier this school year, our first Moss speaker this year was Rice University Professor Douglas Brinkley who spoke about the, con the conservation legacy of Teddy and Franklin Roosevelt. It was an excellent lecture. It is my pleasure tonight uh, to welcome one of Mr. Moss's colleagues and close friends, John Gurman, to the podium to introduce tonight's speaker. Mr. Gurman came to Kincaid in 1967 and retired in 2011. And while at Kincaid, he shared with his students his, his love of history with many puns along the way also. And he had one or two this morning in his introduction. In 1985, he won the Columbiana Award for Excellence in Teaching, and in 2003, he was recognized as the school's distinguished honorary alumnus. In addition to his teaching responsibilities at Kincaid, Mr. German chaired the history department, sponsored the Wiener Fellowship Program, coached the prep bowl teams, various sports, and is still a member of the Moss Distinguished Speaker Series Committee. Mr. German, welcome. Tonight we have our seventh uh, in the line of J. Barry Moss Distinguished Speakers. And of course it's very appropriate it's here in the Moss Amphitheater. Um, our speaker is most appropriate as well. He is an absolute natural uh, for this program. Like Barry, he is an exceptional intellect and like Barry, a superlative teacher. Like Barry, his love is philosophy. Like Barry and the Moss series, he is dedicated to providing and provoking civil discourse. When the Moss Lecture Series was established, we wanted to honor and preserve those things which Barry cherished, namely clear and convincing written expression, public speaking and debate, the development of analytical skills, service to others, and the commitment to excellence, all embodied by our speaker this evening. Indeed, Barry loved our speaker when he met him and heard him as our Wiener Fellow back in 1993. Uh, and Barry would be thrilled at his return to our campus. I was privileged to work with our speaker in that Wiener Fellowship program, and he remains one of our most popular Wiener Fellows to this day. Back then, he was at Rice University, where he was a perennial outstanding professor and most popular teacher. He is now at Rutgers, where he holds the coveted title of Distinguished Professor and continues to rack up student favorite honors right and left. He has earned eight different major teaching awards, some of them multiple times, at prestigious institutions. That would be a remarkable set of accolades um, for any university educator. Uh, but it is especially remarkable when one realizes that he's a professor of philosophy, uh, a field of study that has a reputation 
for being difficult to understand, if not downright dull. <laughs> it is anything, however, but that in his hands, not only because he is passionate and a passionate speaker for his subject, but also because he has a special penchant for being down to earth in his approach and applying his field to daily life, politics, ethics, society, as you will soon witness. Dr. Larry Timpkin received a BA degree in philosophy with highest honors from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He graduated number one among the undergraduate degree recipients that year, all 4,900 of them. He then went on to earn a PhD in philosophy from Princeton. He was then on to Rice and Rutgers with All Souls College at Oxford University, the National Humanities Center, Harvard University, the National Institutes of Health, the Australian National University, where he was when we first tried to get him, uh, and the University of Oslo, Norway, all thrown into the mix. He is the author of an astounding number of works. Two books deserve, I think, individual mention. In 1993, Oxford University Press published Inequality, reviewed as, quote, brilliant and fascinating. His magnum opus appeared just several years ago, in 2012, again published by Oxford, entitled <coughs> Rethinking the Good, Moral Ideals in the Nature of Practical Reasoning. It has garnered such, I combined several reviews here, here's a combined review, quote, an awe-inspiring, almost breathtakingly original tour de force, end quote. I know what the reviewers mean. To this day, over 20 years later, I remember how much he shook me up when in his small group with the Winter Fellowship students, he challenged the age-old syllogism that I had always relied on confidently but unthinkingly. I was sure that because A is better than B, and B is better than C, then B had to be much better than C. And A is certainly better than all of them. Wrong. Okay. And he will show you why. I think you will work up this evening. He has a special way of thinking and analyzing and an especially clear way of presenting those provocative points of view. Indeed, he has a habit of being special to all who cross his path. He has authored a plethora of articles as well, accompanied by a long, truly mind-boggling list of symposia, radio and video appearances, guest speeches, book reviews. I get tired just reading all of them. And you would think that he'd be tired too, but he remains incredibly busy. Here, is, here are some of his speaking engagements, not to mention his other obligations in and out of the classroom. For 2014, speeches at Harvard, two at Princeton, Oxford, London School of Economics, Toronto, Oslo, University of Pennsylvania, Berkeley Law School, USC Law and Philosophy Workshop, three different American Philosophical Association meetings. That's part of his, his agenda. Um, because of his exceptional popularity and manifold involvements, it has taken us a couple of years to book him for a return engagement with Tim Kaye. We are delighted to have him back with us. We're also delighted he continues to list the Wiener Fellowship on his curriculum vitae. <laughs> um, and that he can now add the Moss Lecture Series to that resume. He challenged the upper school students this morning to do what they could and indeed should to help alleviate starvation among the world's children. He intends to challenge us tonight about our notions of philosophy <coughs> and to provoke second thoughts perhaps about some time-honored principles um, that we hold dear. He would be most happy, most happy to take questions at the end, and I suspect you'll have some. <coughs> Please welcome our 2014 J. Barry Moss Distinguished Speaker, Dr. Larry Tipton. This is where we need the benefit of science fiction because what I need to do now is erase from your memories everything you just heard. <laughs> Since there's zero chance of living up to that incredibly generous introduction. <laughs> Thanks to each of you for being here tonight. Thanks to Tom Moore, particularly Georgia Piazza, for their efforts organizing my visit. And a special note of gratitude to John, 
who served as my gracious host when I gave the Wiener Lecture here more than 20 years ago, who recommended me for the Moss Lecture and who patiently persisted over a six-year period, six year period in chasing me down and bringing me back to Kincaid. When John first contacted me about this lecture, he enticed me to come not by telling me the size, Texas size, of my honorarium, <laughs> but by extolling the virtues of the man we are honoring tonight. Among other things, he wrote the following, I quote, J. Barry Moss, aside from being a good friend and close colleague, was to my mind the greatest mind, was to my mind the greatest mind and best teacher whom I knew in my 44 years at Kincaid. He taught philosophy and English, had a divinity degree from Harvard, served as debate coach, was the upper school principal for decades, and so on. What characterized him more than anything else was his professional commitment to scholarship, which he believed to be possible only through an open mind provoked by open-ended discourse. He is deceased now, but he was so very, very special that many of his students got together and contributed funds to establish the annual J. Barry Moss Distinguished Speaker Series to bring light minds to Kincaid." End quote. John proceeded to flatter me a little bit, telling me, among other things, that I was Moss-esque. <laughs> and I'm not sure what that means. But I, <laughs> and that that's as great a compliment as he could come, as he could give, but he didn't have to. I was already hooked. I'm deeply privileged and honored to be giving tonight's talk as part of the annual J. Barry Moss Distinguished Speaker Series. And I'm most grateful to all of his former students, family, colleagues, and friends whose contributions <coughs> made this wonderful event possible. Part one, some common views of philosophy and a few words about the point of philosophy. Let me begin by briefly noting two common conceptions about philosophy. One common conception about philosophy is indicated by a story I once heard about a famous philosopher who was sitting on a plane. After finding his profession, the man sitting next to him excitedly said, you're a philosopher? Tell me some of your sayings. As if philosophers were people who walked around with collections of pearls of wisdom akin to Chairman Mao's Little Red Book. Or Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Alma Mater. A penny saved is a penny earned. A stitch in time saves nine. Well, a penny saved is a penny earned. And a stitch in time does save nine, but that isn't philosophy. Philosophy is not a bunch of short, pithy maxims that you can put on a poster and hang on your wall. Second common conception is conveyed by the following. If people ask me what I do, I tell them I teach. If they ask what I teach, this is true. I tell them, I teach college. <laughs> <laughs> if they're really persistent and ask, what subject in college do you teach? I usually break down, you can't put these people off. <laughs> and I admit that I'm a philosopher. Unfortunately, half the time that provokes the following response, wow, <laughs> a philosopher. Gosh, that's really deep. <laughs> And then they start telling me their dreams. <laughs> of course, I don't usually stop them. Strangers who tell you their dreams in public usually have amazingly bizarre and kinky <laughs> dreams to tell. <laughs> but despite this common reaction, philosophy is not psychology, Freudian or otherwise. I won't be able to interpret your dreams for you. And even if I could, it wouldn't be because I'm a philosopher. If you ask a bunch of third graders, as I once did long ago, to a group that included Kim Atkins' daughter, Lindsay, where are you? There they are. Gary Atkins' daughter as well, Lindsay. If you ask them what a builder or a doctor or a farmer does, they can all answer. Farmer grows our food, a builder constructs our homes, a doctor heals our bodies. If you ask those same third graders what a philosopher does, they have no clue. Unless one of them is my son, in which case he raises his hand and announces triumphantly, a philosopher is someone who lies in bed a lot, staring at the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> Yet importantly, the philosopher is engaging in a quintessentially human experience, 
when he or she is staring at that ceiling, he or she is thinking, he's questioning, he's trying to understand himself and his role in the universe. John told me that Barry Moss loved teaching philosophy because he loved to challenge his students. That is the essence of philosophy. To challenge even our most basic assumptions to ask ourselves whether there are good reasons for our beliefs, or whether we only have them because we learned them from our parents, our teachers, our church, our society. Most of us know that if we are born in a different place, in a different time, or a different country, or we're members of a different race, religion, class, gender, or political system, many of our deepest beliefs would be different than they, in fact, are. Given this, how can we be so sure, as most of us seemingly are, that our fundamental beliefs are right? That is a question that haunts the philosopher, as he or she subjects even the most obvious assumptions to philosophical scrutiny. Well, what's the point in that, one might wonder? Well. One might similarly have wondered, what was the point in challenging the obvious fact that the Earth was flat? Or the obvious fact that the Earth remained still while being orbited by the Sun? Or the obvious fact, until Einstein, until Einstein proved otherwise, that if one event preceded a second, it couldn't also be true that the second event preceded the first. I still don't know how that could be. <laughs> really? How could that be? And yet, I'm going to believe it is. I said that philosophy was a quintessentially human experience. To see that it is, think of the most important differences between humans and other animals. It isn't that they have fur and fangs, nor that we walk on two legs or have opposable thumbs. Turns out some chimpanzees also have a puzzle of thumbs. You know that? It's that we possess, to a degree unmatched in the known universe, such traits as language, arts, self consciousness, reflection, religion, and morality. The really crucial, essential difference between humans and most animals concerns the nature of our minds and what these allow us to do. As Plato and Aristotle would have put it, the distinctively human traits are all manifestations of our reason. We have reason, while mere animals are guided largely, if not wholly, by instinct. Aristotle thought that reason is the highest part of man, the divine part of man. He claimed that reason, more than anything else, is man. For more than two millennium, people have recognized that people have two sides. They have a lower animal side, and they have a higher rational side. Philosophy caters to the rational side. Farmers, builders, and doctors, what they do is important, very important. I'm so pleased they're there. But they all cater to that side of human beings that we have in common with mice or squirrels. No offense to those of you who are doctors or builders or farmers. Even a mouse needs food and shelter and good health, but only a human fears death, questions the meaning of her existence, seeks to understand herself and her universe via language, art, religion, and morality. Science and engineering are great at giving us tools to accomplish our ends. Great at telling us how to reach our goals. But it is philosophy that helps us to consider what our ends or goals should be. Will Durant, the great social historian, clearly saw this, writing in his book, The Story of Philosophy, that, I quote, science tells us how to heal and how to kill it reduces the death rate in retail, and then it kills us wholesale in war. But only wisdom can tell us when to heal and when to kill. 
to observe processes and to construct means is science. To criticize and coordinate ends is philosophy. And because in these days our means and instruments have multiplied beyond our interpretation and synthesis of ideals and ends, our life is full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Science without philosophy, facts without perspective and valuation cannot save us from havoc and despair. Science gives us knowledge, but only philosophy can give us wisdom. No doubt Durant is exaggerating in claiming that only philosophy can give us wisdom, but he is right that we need to know more than just how best to accomplish whatever goals we have on the path we are now on. We need to know whether our goals and our path are worthy of the one miraculous human life that we each have to live. For that, we need more than science and engineering. We need the sort of careful, thoughtful, and deep questioning that philosophy prompts. And so philosophy addresses that part of ourselves which more than anything else makes us what we are. The human side or, if you will, the divine side. When the Bible says that God created humans in his image, it doesn't mean God's physical image. God doesn't even exist in space and time. It means God's spiritual image. God gave humans the ability to think, to reason, to freely choose a plan of life, to freely choose to be virtuous and act morally or not. These are all fundamental features that distinguish us from mice or squirrels from most of the rest of the known universe. Part two. Does philosophy really matter? The preceding will strike many of you as a bunch of self-serving poppycock that <laughs> philosophers like to tell themselves to justify their place in the academy if not their existence. This is because many people have another common perception about philosophy, namely that it's just a bunch of hot air or opinions that never have any effect in the real world. This view is deeply wrong-headed, both at the macro level and at the micro level. Let's start with the micro level. Philosophy can have a profound effect on the lives of individuals when they actually pause to think about their deepest beliefs and what they should believe. One former student of mine once wrote on his final evaluation of the class, Dear Dr. Temkin, I hate you. I used to enjoy smoking. Now I realize that I really ought to give it up and send the money I saved to help the needy. Of course, I'm thinking that's great in two ways. It's good for the needy, and it's good for the student. Another wrote me years later. Dear Dr. Temkin, you won't remember me, but you changed my life. Then this letter goes on to say he was sitting around talking about how you'd taken a class with me. He was telling his wife about how he ended up doing what he was doing, and she said, you ought to write him, you ought to tell him that. What was his path? Well, he went on to do law school. He was trained to be a lawyer. He was going to be a lawyer just like all the other group people, which meant he was going to be a corporate lawyer, and he was going to make a shitload of money. That's a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> and he started off doing that. He moved to Colorado. He was in a big firm. He was making a lot of money. But in the back of his head, he couldn't stop thinking about a section of a class that he took as a freshman. Happened to be my class. And it happened to be on animal liberation and rights of animals. Couldn't stop thinking about it. So he started doing pro bono work on the side, earning a lot of money as a corporate lawyer, and then working on the side on behalf of animal rights groups. And at some point, he looked in the mirror and he said, you know what? This is what I want to do. He left his job as a corporate lawyer, and he started working full time on behalf of animals. Probably a bad move, actually. But anyway, he blames me for it. <laughs> he seemed to be happy about it. His wife probably blames me for it. <laughs> Yet another student wrote the following, quote, throughout the course I wondered why I chose to remain in the class, but now I have my answer. The hard work was definitely worth it. Now whenever I make a decision, I find myself wondering what is the right thing to do? And I think I'm better able to justify 
my decisions. This class has truly helped me to become a better person. Thanks again. Finally, a former student of mine who later went on to become a successful doctor wrote me a long five-page letter which included the following observation. Among my most steadfast realizations about medicine is that all doctors should first be educated in philosophy and particularly ethics. It's funny, but I know that each day I spent reading Kant was worth a week in the emergency department or a month in microbiology labs. I could go on and on, but the point is clear enough. There's no doubt that philosophy can and often does have a profound effect on the lives of individuals. As for the macro level, this isn't the time or place for me to trace out a basic class in the history of ideas one of the best people in the world for doing that is right over here, Tom Haskell. But put simply, the course of Western civilization has been profoundly influenced by the work of philosophers, and anyone who indicates otherwise just displays their vast ignorance of these matters. The really big ideas that govern our communities and our lives on a daily basis, ideas like liberty and justice and equality, and rights and democracy, these stem from and were fundamentally shaped by the likes of Plato, Aristotle, Rousseau, Locke, Mill, Kant, Marx, and others. It would literally be impossible to exaggerate the importance of these men and their lives, their ideas on our lives and our way of life. From the day you're born to the day you die. Moreover, philosophy can often have a major impact on the world in wholly unpredictable and generally unrecognized ways. To see that, permit me to pass along some rather immodest remarks about the impact my own work on equality has apparently had that I only learned about quite by accident a few months back. This will be a bit of a shaggy dog story, but I hope you'll find it interesting. I spent 15 years working on a book called Inequality. It was a highly abstract theoretical book. It was written for philosophers. In writing my book, I was just trying to get clear in my own mind what it is an egalitarian ultimately cares about. But in doing this, I asked a question that philosophers had never asked before. And in trying to answer that question, I ultimately presented and defended a whole new approach to understanding inequality. On the old approach, inequality was regarded as simple, holistic, and essentially distributive. In my book, I argue that in fact, inequality was extraordinarily complex, individualistic, and essentially comparative. I won't try to explain these terms here. But the upshot is that when, in 1999, the World Health Organization decided that they were interested in promoting equality in global health, I was flown to Geneva to explain my views and how best to think about and measure inequality. I went to Geneva. <clears throat> I gave a talk. I met with a bunch, one of the head honchos there, who basically asked me, how he could effectively promote equality of global health with his several hundred million dollar budget. And then I went home. I never gave it another thought. Until a few years ago, when after giving a lecture at Harvard School of Public Health, a friend of mine there by the name of Dan Wickler asked me if he'd ever told me the story of what happened after my visit to the WHO. Dan was the person who had originally arranged my visit. He and I were colleagues at Harvard together for a year. And he proceeded to relay roughly the following story. Larry, I never told you this? No, I have no idea. So this is amazing. After you left, nobody stopped talking about your work for the next three days. Just back and forth, back and forth, just talking, talking, talking. And then the next day, on the fourth day, everyone around the world connected with the World Health Organization went in to turn on their emails and they could not access them. Why not? Because the big honcho that I had talked to at the World Health Organization 
had taken control. He basically hacked into the computers of the World Health Organization, set up a poll, and made everybody answer these poll questions around the world, if they were in the World Health Organization, before they could do any emails. Well, you know how addicted people are to emails. <laughs> they had to answer every question. What were the poll questions? They were taken from my book. In my book, I set up a series of diagrams, and I said, if you present these diagrams and you ask the question, how does this situation compare to this situation with respect to equality, you can learn, depending on the answers, what things people care most about with respect to equality and how much they might care about them vis-a-vis -vis each other. And then this guy, who's, uh, uh, who was a wunderkind at Harvard for many years, he created the thing called Dollies and Qualies, a brilliant man, then went to the World Health Organization, eventually ended up, he's now working for Gates out in Seattle, something called the Institute for Health Metrics. He took all the data based on the diagrams in my book, and he pushed them together, and he came up with a single measure that would enable him to say, for every country in the world, how good or bad it was with respect to the inequality or equality of healthcare distribution in that world. So that's the story I heard at that point. I told you this is a shaggy dog story. I heard that about three years ago. I thought that was pretty interesting. I actually asked him the following, well, did he at least credit me? Did he put a footnote in? <laughs> You'll be interested in this. He said, no, didn't put a footnote. We did discuss it since we got the ideas from you. I said, well, you know, intellectual property rights, that's all we academics have. He said, yeah, yeah, but you see, you have to understand this guy. It's the reason I haven't named him. He's, <laughs> he says, Besides wanting all the glory for himself, he says, I want to make a difference in the world. I want to go to the health ministers. I want to give them this number, and I want them to take it seriously. If we tell them we got the idea from a philosopher? <laughs> if we tell them we got the idea from an economist, that would have been okay. But from a philosopher, no. So he just didn't say who he got the ideas from, so off he went. Fast forward. A couple of months ago, I get a phone call out of the blue from my friend Dan with her at Harvard. He says, Larry, you got a few minutes? I say, sure, I always have a few minutes for you guys. He says, I thought I'd call you up and swell your head a little bit. I said, are you sure that's a good idea? <laughs> you want to talk to my wife about that first? <laughs> Not a good idea. He said, no, no, I think you need to hear this. I said, great, tell me about it. He said, so here's this really interesting thing. When the SARS epidemic broke out in China, Harvard sent a bunch of people from the School of Epidemiology over to help them in dealing with the SARS epidemic. Close connections arose, and they agreed to have a major conference every year, one year at China, one year at Harvard. Since then, they just completed the major conference at Harvard a day or two earlier, prompting his phone call to me. What prompted it was the following. China, for a long time, as many of you know, wanted to become the greatest economic power in the world. Their goal, and they were single-minded about this, was to overtake the West, and in particular the United States, in all the major economic factors, steel production, you know, blah, 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 blah. They focused on that, and they did an amazing job. It cost a lot of things, but they did an amazing job. But in the meantime, they ignored everything else. There was one and only thing they were focusing on, and that was economic growth. And then something rather miraculous occurred, which is they began to pay attention to health. And they really had a, a tremendous change in the direction of China. And over a period of roughly 10 to 12 to 14 years, China went from a country that serviced almost nobody, if they weren't a member of the Communist Party higher up in terms of health care, to providing what's called Tier 1, which is roughly the basic health care that most people need for virtually the entire country. Not the entire country, but virtually the entire country. The World Health Organization, Harvard School of Public Health, they're just amazed at how China could have accomplished this over a 10 or 12 year period. But what they're really amazed about is what caused the transformation. Why do you go from a country that's all about the economics to suddenly we need to provide, in essence, universal health care to our citizens? And the Deputy Minister for Health told my friend, I'll tell you why. Because in 2002, the World Health Organization published their Global Burden of Disease. And in that global burden of disease, they not only talked about all the diseases in all the countries of the world, they talked about how each of the countries of the world fare with respect to the equality of health care. 
in those worlds, in those countries. And China was one of the worst. And the leaders got together and they looked at each other and in essence they said, we can't have this. We can't say we want to be one of the greatest countries in the world and be one of the worst countries in the world with respect to the equality of health care. And they changed directions. And in roughly 12 years, they went from a few people being covered by health care, the wealthy and the communist affiliated, to the vast majority of the population getting tier one basic health care. As my friend points out, China has roughly 21% 20, 20 of the world's population, over 1.3 billion people. And then he said to me on the phone, I estimate that your work is probably responsible for saving maybe 200 million lives. He then added very sweetly, I think you should sleep well at night. <laughs> the point of all this, I didn't start out thinking about inequality for practical reasons. I just didn't think about inequality because I was puzzled by a problem. I was just trying to do basic research, basic philosophical research. What do I think? Why do I think it? I was trying to understand something better. But if my friend is right, this ultimately led to having a huge impact on the world in ways that neither he, nor I, nor anyone else, including any of you, would ever have known about had he not had this chance conversation with the Chinese officials at a conference at Harvard a few months back. If my work can have such large indirect effects, how much more has there probably been by the real philosophical giants of my generation that most of us are utterly oblivious to? Part three, rethinking the good. So in the brief time remaining, I want to share with you just a few claims from my 2012 book, Rethinking the Good, Moral Ideals, and the Nature of Practical Reasoning. That book, I challenge a host of basic assumptions that have been almost universally accepted, not nearly as true, but as obviously true. I can only touch on one of those tonight. But before presenting the view in question, which John has already let the cat out about, which is okay, I want to first ask everybody in this audience two questions. Now we become interactive. <laughs> Suppose I offer you the following choice. Choice one, you're going to have a certain intensity of pain. I'm going to represent how intense it is by raising my hand like this. So this will be more intense, this will be less intense. Certain intensity of pain for a certain duration. If I go like that, that's how long it lasts. So I'm going to give you a certain intensity of pain for a certain duration. or for you or a loved one, someone you care about a lot, a little bit less intense, just a little, not a lot, just a little, but it's going to last two or three or five times as long. Okay? So that's the question. You're going to suffer a certain intensity of pain for a certain duration, or a little bit less, just a little, for two or three or five times as long. Okay? That's my question. I want you to answer. So you can all see how you answer. How many want the first one? How many want the slightly more intense, but much, much shorter? Okay, come on, raise your hands if you feel it. How many want the other? <laughs> okay, one person. You are what we call, sir, an outlier. <laughs> Not a liar, just an outlier. We'll come back to that later. And you're also nuts, but we'll come back to that later. So. <laughs> wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Next, I'm going to ask you a different question. I tell you that you're going to live a long time. I don't tell you how long. I just say a long time. I mean a really long time, like Methuselah is nothing. 969 years. You're going to live a long time. Two ways your life might go. You guys will appreciate this. I came up with this example when I lived in Houston. You'll know why in one second. Two ways your life might go. On both lives, you have at least... 30 mosquito bites a month. <laughs> That's the Houston part. 30 mosquito bites a month for the duration of your life. Okay? That's a given. Now, the difference between the two lives is this. In the first life, if you choose to have that one, at some point during the course of your life, you will have two years of the most excruciating torture humanly imaginable. I want you to take this question seriously for a second. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm going to make light of it, but I want you to take it seriously. For two years, 
you would have unremitting pain. Everything you've ever seen in a movie, everything you've ever read in the worst books, everything you've ever imagined in your worst nightmares, that's what's going to happen to you for two straight years. You're going to have the uh, bamboo shoots under the fingernails, you're going to have the wax under the eyelids, your genitals are going to be hooked up to the electrodes, and you're going like this, and for 22 or 24 hours, 21, 20 hours a day, you're going to be suffering, and every day you're going to wish you were dead. But then, this is the magic of philosophy, we get to do this in philosophy, it's so good. At the end of those two years of excruciating torture, every moment of which you'd rather be dead, they're going to give you a pill, and you'll forget it. And it will have no other impact on the whole rest of your life. That's it. Now at this point, most people say, I don't care what the other choice is, I want the other one. <laughs> <laughs> I know I don't want that, but imagine that, I know I don't want that, but let me tell you what the other choice is, just to make sure you're clear. Here's the other choice. Instead of two years of excruciating torture, you get one extra mosquito bite on. Okay? So instead of, I love that look. That's exactly what you're supposed to have. Like, that's it? That's all? No, that's it. There's no catch. There's no catch. Instead of two years of excruciating torture and 30 mosquito bites a month, you will have 31 mosquito bites for the ratio of your life. Okay, simple question. How many want the life with the torture? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, how many want the extra mosquito bite? Okay. These are very, very robust results. I've been presenting versions of such cases for many, many years and now to thousands of people and audiences all over the world. It will not surprise you to learn that well over 95% of my audiences everywhere, it's not just that you're in Texas, will agree with you folks. And as I often like to put it, of the few who aren't, some are just being difficult. Some are figuring it's a trick question. It can't be that easy. I'll go the other way. I'll look brilliant later. And the others haven't understood the question. <laughs> I'm not quite sure which one you are. Okay. So I'm going to put these results aside for a few minutes. I'm going to come back to them at the very end of this talk. And now I want to introduce the main standard belief that I challenge in my book which is known as the axiom of transitivity. The axiom of transitivity is represented up here. I just didn't add the last piece of it. What it says, as John says, is if all things considered A is better than B and all things considered B is better than C, then it must be true that A is better than C. That's the axiom of transitivity. An analog to the better that axiom of transitivity is the equally as good as axiom of transitivity, if A is equally as good as B and B is equally as good as C, then A is equally as good as C. So for example, according to the axiom of transitivity, for better than, if it were true, and no doubt is, that all things considered, Kincaid was a better school than Bel Air, and all things considered, Bel Air was a better school than St. John's, <laughs> then it must be true that all things considered, Kincaid is a better school than St. John's. And similarly, if it were true that good company barbecue were equally as good as good company hamburgers, and good company hamburgers were equally as good as good company seafood, then indeed it would follow that good company barbecue must be equally as good as good company seafood. Anyway, I think it's fair to say that for most of human history, people have believed that the axiom of transitivity not only is true, but must be true. Indeed, most people have ever even paused to think about it have believed that it's obviously true. In fact, many of the most brilliant living philosophers and economists have claimed that the axiom of transitivity is either true by definition, in virtue of what it means to say that all things considered, one thing is better than another, or in virtue of the logic of goodness and the relation between goodness and better than. These names won't mean anything to you, but when I started thinking about this material 30 plus years ago, I was literally told by Tom Nagel and Derek Parfit, both of whom have won the Rolf Schock Award given by the Swedish Royal Academy, which is the closest thing to a Nobel Prize in philosophy. One is given every three years to the, for significant contributions to philosophy. Both of them looked me in the face and said, as Tom said to me, Larry, I want to know what someone meant who claimed that all things considered, A is better than B, and all things considered, B is better than C, but all things considered, A isn't better than C. Another person who told me this was Tim Scanlon, who 
Later was the MacArthur Award winner, you know, the so-called Genius Award, chairman of the philosophy department at Harvard for many, many years, and so on. They all told me, true by definition. Some people claim that better than must be transitive because all comparative relations are transitive. All dot dot er then relations are transitive. So just as it must be true that if John is taller than Mary and Mary is taller than Tom, then John must be taller than Tom. And similarly, for heavier than, faster than, smarter than, and so it must also be true for better than. Furthermore, many have claimed that the axiom of transitivity is like the law of non-contradiction, which tells us that if it's true that Kincaid is the best school in Texas, it can't also be true that Kincaid is not the best school in Texas. These two principles have been regarded as a fundamental principle of consistency, and as such, a fundamental principle of rationality itself. As for example, it's no accident that the dominant conception of individual rationality depends on something called expected utility theory, and that this theory relies on the transitive of better than as one of, and perhaps its most fundamental axioms. Moreover, expected utility theory underlies the main theories we use to model rational behavior, namely game theory and decision theory, and it also underlies most of modern economics. So if one rejects the axiom of transitivity, virtually all of our results in those areas would be undermined. In addition, many have thought that the transitivity of all things considered better than is crucial to practical reasoning, <coughs> in the sense that we need better than to be a transitive relation if we ever hope to be able to make rational choices in the world. I don't have time to fully illustrate all the ways in which this is true, but I'll just mention two. The first is the so-called worry about the problem of the money pump, which I'll just give you this way. Suppose you think that better than isn't a transitive relation, so you think A could be better than B is better than C, which could be better than A. Suppose that could be the case, and you have B. Well, if A is better than B, you would pay to move from B to A. But if C is better than A, you would pay to move from A to C. But if B is better than C, you would pay to move from C to B. You'd be right back where you started. You paid three times. <laughs> and of course, it's called the money pump by the economists because you'll just go around and around and around until the end of the day, you end up exactly where you started, and you're broke. So that seems like a really nasty result. You wouldn't want that to be the case. If better than is intransitive, how are you going to avoid that? Second, when faced with a complex decision between a number of alternatives, such as trying to decide which of seven car models to buy, when there are so many factors to consider, like cost, gas mileage, upkeep, looks, comfort, reliability, and so on, we often adopt a simple, straightforward decision procedure. We just focus on two models at a time. We compare the first with the second in terms of everything we care about. If the first is better than the second, then we throw the second out. And we compare the first with the third. If the first is worse than the third, we throw the first out. And then, in a series of pairwise judgments, we only need six, we can determine the best car. How many of you recognize you've done that, right? We all do that. We all do that. <laughs> that reasoning, which we gauge in every day of our lives, more or less, without even knowing it, presupposes the axiom of transitivity. Because, look, you can't disregard the second model just because it's worse than the first unless you can be sure that the second model couldn't be better than the third model, which itself was better than the first. It's the axiom of transitivity which guarantees that this couldn't be the case, and so which justifies our everyday practical reasoning. In sum, we can see that for most of human history, <clears throat> people have assumed that all things considered better than must be transitive, that's a fundamental principle of consistency and rationality, and that can be safely relied on in everyday reasoning. But after more than 27 years of thinking about this topic, I'm not even sure that the axiom of transitivity is true, much less obviously true. And I am sure that even if it is true, it's not, as many people have previously insisted, true by definition or in virtue of the logic of goodness. To the contrary, my book, Rethinking the Good, is filled with arguments that challenge the axiom of transitivity. 
In the short time remaining, I'm just going to sketch two of the challenges I have offered, two of many. Return to the first two questions I asked you not too long ago. Remember what you said about them. Most people firmly believe that the answers you gave to those questions are correct. But presto magic, <laughs> those two views are incompatible with the accident of transitivity. If you accept those views, you must reject transitivity. Why, you wonder? I'll just explain it to you. It's really pretty simple. I'm going to describe a spectrum of alternatives. Okay? In the first alternative, every life is a long life. Every life has 30 mosquito bites in it. First member of the spectrum, this two years is the most in tor intense torture imaginable. And the second is four years of torture, almost as bad. Remember when I asked you if there's a certain intensity of pain and a certain duration, a little bit less and a little bit longer? I didn't ask you, tell you how intense it was or how long it was. And I didn't need to. Because this is generalizable. It doesn't matter whether it's really intense or only medium intense or only mild intense. We'd rather have something that's only a little bit less intense and shorter. I mean, a little bit less intense. A little bit more intense and shorter than something a little bit less and much, much longer. So I'm going to give you the spectrum of alternatives. The first world, two years of intense torture, 30 mosquito weights. The next, four years of torture, almost as bad. We all think the first is better than the second. I think we're right. Now I compare the four years to eight years of torture, almost as bad. We all think the four is better than the eight. I think we're right. Now we compare the eight to the 16. We all think the eight is better than the 16. I think we're right. I'm just going to keep going all the way down. At the end, there's nothing left from mosquito bite. If transitivity holds, the first is better than the second, the second is better than the third, the third is better than the fourth, all the way down. It follows that the actual transitivity, the first must be better than the last. None of us believe that. A couple of you did. So we have these views, and these views actually turn out to correspond to deep views about how to think about the good that are almost universally accepted, which are incompatible with the accident of transitivity. Just going to give one more, and then we're going to bring this to a close quickly. I have three alternative universes on the war. We philosophers, we like to play with our heads. People call philosophy a lot of mental masturbation. I think that's not so bad. OK, so we play in our minds. We give thought experiments, and we find these thought experiments useful for sharpening our focus about what we believe. So here's a thought experiment. Suppose there's three possible universes, A, B, and C. Each of them has an infinite number of people. I'll just put it this way. In one, there's one person at level zero, another one at level one, another at level two, another at level three, etc. Infinite number. This one, there's one person at negative one, one person at negative two, one person at negative three, and infinite number of them that way. B looks a lot like A. There's one person at level zero, one person at one, one person at two, one person at three, one person at negative one, one person at negative two, one person at negative three. C looks a lot like B. One person at zero, one blah, blah, blah. You can see. Okay. If I ask you the following question, which of those outcomes is better or worse than the others, or how do they compare, what would you say? The same. Good, thank you. They're the same, of course they're the same. There's no difference whatsoever, maybe. Presto magic coming up. Okay. So I do think, I'm just going to tell your story. Suppose everybody who exists in B is different from everybody who exists in A. So these people are all named Barry, Barry 1, Barry 2, Barry 3. Sorry for these Barrys, Barry. And these people are all named Sid, Sid 1, Sid 2, Sid 3, Sid 3. But they're all exactly the same in every other way except for their names, and they're different people. I think if the people in A are different from the people in B, then there's no doubt whatsoever that these 12 terms are exactly equally as good. There's nothing to choose between them. I also think, not surprisingly, that if the people in B are different from the people in C, then B will be exactly equally as good. So there's nothing to choose between those. So let's just stipulate that's true. Everyone in A is different from everyone in B, and everyone in B is different from everyone in C. In that case, I think it really is true that A is equal to B, and I think it really is true that B is equal to C. It's not complex. But if all things considered better, I mean, if equally as good as is a transitive relation, then it must be true that A is equally as good as C, is it? But it kind of looks that way, right? 
but maybe it's not. I told you these people were different from these people, and these people were different from these people, but I didn't tell you that these people were different from those people, did I? Suppose they're not. Suppose everybody who exists in this world also exists in this world and vice versa. It's the exact same people. There's one difference. You started out with this world and you added one million units to every person, making them much, much better off. So the person who's at level zero in this world, the very same person is at level a million here, which is a lot better. The person who's at level one here is at a level one million and one here, that's a lot better, two three, four, negative two, all the way up, et cetera. In other words, every person here also exists here and is much better off. Nobody else exists. Now do we think A and C are exactly equally as good? That's not even close to right. A is vastly better than C. But that doesn't change my ranking of A or B or B or C. What's relevant and significant to the comparison between A and B is the fact that the very same people who exist here also exist here and are much better off. That's why we think A is better than C. That's got no bearing at all on how A compares to B. And no bearing at all on how B compares to C. So it turns out there can be a factor that's relevant and significant for comparing these two, which isn't relevant and significant for comparing these two in which case, as I argue in my book, there's no reason for transitivity to obtain. <clears throat> Regarding my second example, our standard conceptions of infinity tell us that the total amount of utility in A and C is exactly the same. And it is. But this just shows us that most of us do not merely care about how much total good or bad exists in an outcome. Rather, we also care about the way the goods or bad is in an outcome affect people for better or worse. This turns out to have profound implications for our understanding about the nature and structure of the good, moral ideals, and practical reasoning. Unfortunately, my book raises far more problems than it answers. Indeed, some believe that it shakes to the core our understanding of what it means to be a rational animal. And it amounts to the strongest argument for practical skepticism since Hume's great work in the 18th century. Since I'm not a skeptic, I wish it were otherwise. But then the philosopher in me seeks the truth wherever it leads. And I retain the conviction that if we could survive in advance in the face of the results of Copernicus and Einstein, both of whom utterly upended the dominant worldviews of their day, we can certainly survive in advance in the face of whatever unsettling effects my puny arguments may provoke. Thank you very much for your attention. And I am more than happy to respond to questions. I'll start here and then move on. Yes. Uh, is J.J. or Big Barry's book the idea of progress philosophy, or is it just definition of the term? I'm sorry to say that I don't know. I haven't read the book. Uh -huh. I can't. I just can't answer. I don't know. Well, what about Hegel's definition of love? Was it is that a philosophy, or is that just definition of the term? <laughs> I think I'm going to say I don't know about that either. Uh, is it philosophy or is it definition of term? A lot of what goes on in philosophy is a definition of term in order to get clear about what we think about and then see if that's what we think about, what implications that does that have for other claims we might make about that. If it has an implication for other claims we might make about that and we don't like those implications, we might think, hmm, maybe we don't want to, to understand this term in this way. Maybe we don't actually understand it in this way. We thought we did, did but maybe we don't and so on and so forth. So I don't think I quite want to make the distinction that your question is prodding me to make. Is it just a definition or is it philosophy? I do agree about this. Nothing substantive ever follows from a definition. You can define things however you want. That doesn't make it true. That doesn't make it useful. That doesn't make it important. On the other hand, it is important to get clear on what we mean by our terms. So we can see in the many arguments where we use those terms if we're using them in a consistent, thoughtful manner. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. 
So in the second part of your question about the pain that we would choose, mosquito bites or the excruciating pain, and then you never remember it, never have it again. Um, my father <coughs> to my son, who has type 1 diabetes, so in a sense, he's bitten by a mosquito at least, I mean, it's more painful than that when he has to test his blood at least eight times a day. So I yeah. began to think about that. And he would definitely choose two years of excruciating pain if he could get rid of type 1 diabetes yeah. in his life. So I wonder, do you see that with people with chronic life-threatening diseases? That to them, they will choose uh, excruciating pain if they can get rid of their chronic life-threatening condition. Do you, have you found that? So you're asking an empirical question to which I don't have an answer. I'm a moral philosopher who thinks about certain kinds of questions. You could go out there in the world, people could do that study. But here's what I do want to say, and I think you already see it yourself in the way you posed your question. I think the one, one extra mosquito bite a, life, a, a day is actually very different than having a chronic disease like type 1 diabetes. Because it isn't just the pinprick. It's you have, to be, you have to moderate your life. You have to change your life. You have to be worried about your diet. It affects you in so many ways. You have, whenever you travel, you have to carry your insulin with you or whatever it is. So I don't have to say that we wouldn't make some trade-offs between a lesser pain or a lesser something that influences our life in some way and two years of torture. But I don't think the mosquito bite is the analogy. The mosquito bite's just the mosquito bite doesn't impact us in any of the other ways that your son is impacted well, by having this disease. Maybe transfer it to a less less um, serious condition, but yeah. a chronic condition yeah. that um, I think many people who suffer from chronic conditions, maybe it's not life-threatening, but there's sort of a low-level depression that goes with that, and maybe even they would choose. Maybe it's the equivalent of a mosquito bite, but it's you're not at 100%. And so maybe if you had the choice that you wouldn't have that low level malaise the rest of your life, you would choose the two years of pain. Okay, so I have, again, I have, I have two comments, but I'm afraid that you've already answered them in the way you, you phrased it. So first of all, the mere fact that someone would or wouldn't choose anything is not so much the question. The question is how they should choose. And of course, we didn't get into that here, but I would, you know, but you're describing a low-level depression. Depression is a serious disease. You said it was a low-level depression, but depression is one of the most serious, in terms of the World Health Organization, when they measure the, the impact of disease in the world, in the developed world, depression comes up with the highest amount. So, so I know it's a low level, but well, the bottom line. That's the wrong word. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, so the point is, if you move it down to the point where it's just like a mosquito bite, which was my example, then I think there's no reason anybody should choose that. I can say more about that. Look, let me say something about this. this is so it, it's specific to the mosquito bite. No, 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 no. It's, but look, but look, this is very important, extremely important. It would be enough if it was specific to the mosquito bite. Because this is a claim about the axiom of transitivity, about the logic or nature of better than. You only need one single counterexample, one. That's all you need, one counterexample. If all things considered better than isn't a transit relation, if it's only mosquito bites that lead to this problem, which is not, my book's filled with other arguments and examples like this and a lot of other ones, that would be enough to undermine the central fundamental axiom. You don't have to falsify a law of physics a thousand times to show the law is mistaken. You only have to prove it's wrong once. If you prove it wrong, it's wrong once. It's wrong. You need something else. But let me just say one more thing about the mosquito bites. How many people want to get in just so I know? I know we're going to stop fairly soon. OK. So let me just say something more about you, and then I'll come to you. Then. All right. So this is kind of fun, I think, because I get to draw, and I'm the world's worst drawer, as you're about to see. But you'll still know what I've just drawn. <laughs> All right. Caramel. There we go. I think I lived next to you for too long. Okay. So this is a camel. Okay. So here's an interesting thing about camels. You know, you put a piece of straw on its back and the camel's back doesn't break. Then you put another piece of straw on its back. This really has nothing to do with camels, but you know, that's the example. And it doesn't break. You put another one, it doesn't break, another one doesn't break, another one doesn't break, etc. Of course, if you pile it up till there's enough straw heading up from the heavens, at some point the camel's back will break. No surprise there, right? 
But now suppose this is what happens instead. You put a piece of straw on the camel's back, and then you blow it off. And it's gone. And then the next day, you put another piece of straw on the camel's back, and you blow it off. It's gone. And the next day, you put another piece of straw on the camel's back, and you blow it off. It's gone. Camel's back will never break. I think mosquito bites across time and across people are like this piece that's blown off. And what you're imagining is the straw that's just staying on, and every day it's kind of wearing on them like a Chinese water torture. Right. It's more and more and more. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, my first question is, I'd like a, uh, I was wondering about uh, your second example, the one yep. with the, uh, the A, B, and C. Yep. Uh, could you uh, re-clarify the point about um, adding a million to C and how that doesn't affect the relations between B and C? But right. affect your relations between A and C? Sure. I'd be happy to try and do that. So <laughs> the idea is this. And maybe I'll just clarify it and not go into the background theory. But the thing is, there was a dominant conception of rationality that people accepted without even knowing it. And it's what I call the internal aspect view. On the internal aspect view, how good or bad an outcome depends solely on the internal features of that outcome. Whatever it is you care about, freedom, justice, equality, any combination thereof, any interaction effects, doesn't matter. You look at everything that's going on inside that outcome, that tells you how good or bad it is. I want to say for human history, that's what we thought was going on. And then if that's the case, if this gets a number representing how good it is, say 100, we'll call this A, and you have another one over here, B, and it gets a score based on its internal features. It gets a number, we'll call it 80. And then you have another outcome, C, based solely on its internal features, 60. Since the internal features are the same, whether you compare it with B or with C or the same, the score for A never changes. How good or bad it is just depends on what's going on here. And similarly for here, and similarly for here. And it turns out on that view, the dominant view, without even being aware of it. Things like the axiom of transitivity hold. But what if it's not like that? What if, in fact, is what I call an essentially comparative view? On an essentially comparative view of ideals, how good or bad an outcome is doesn't depend solely on its internal features. It depends, to some extent, on the alternative with which it's compared. That opens up a whole new world. Now. What's going on here is one of these. Because you can't just look at the internal features of C to know how it compares to A or B. It depends on other facts that only come up when you make a certain comparison. Hang on one second. So if the people in B are different from the people in C, then it doesn't matter. They're exactly the same. But if the people in C are the very same as the people in A, then we pay attention to how the particular people fare. Are they better off in this world or worse off in that world? That doesn't come into play in comparing it with B. It does come into play in comparing it with A. And that's why it can be true that this is equal to this and this is equal to this. And it doesn't follow because the internal aspect view isn't what we're using that this has to be equal to that. So. Um in the, in the circle model, I, I, I forgot. What it I doesn't mean. matter. Internal aspect view here. Aspect. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there is the same good, but it provides different results in different scenarios? Or no, it's more, uh, oh, on this one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. On this one, how good or bad an outcome is <coughs> depends solely on what's going on in that outcome, and it never changes. It doesn't matter how you compare it to anything else. On this one, which, by the way, is what most of our ideals actually reflect, it has a different structure. Does it work like this? It works like this. That opens up a new, whole new realm of, sadly, problems. There was, how do your, uh, just so I know, you get a question in if there are time. Oh, perfect. How do your students, how do you see comparing today from when you first started? What differences do you see there? And how does that compare 
when you've been teaching you know other cultures overseas australia mm -hmm. do, you, do you have any comparisons with the education system there where they're doing better are their students better than ours are they equal yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great i love it so to be honest again I have nothing really particularly insightful to say about this. I will say, I can say a couple of things um, that are relevant to the particular question you asked. But usually when I travel elsewhere, I'm on research fellowships. So when I'm in Australia, I'm doing research, I'm not teaching. When I'm at Princeton, I'm doing research, I'm not teaching. Et cetera, et cetera. Now, how do students fare? It's certainly true. You guys all know this at King K, those you have seen, <laughs> you know, you're going through this. Um, it's harder and harder to get into top schools these days. So hard, it's unbelievable. I was at a dinner at Harvard one night and I was sitting with someone who was on the admissions committee, who was chair of the admissions committee at Colgate. She had previously been on admissions committees at Princeton. She said, we're turning away people at Colgate now that would have been admitted in a second at Princeton 15 years ago. So I have, without a doubt, noticed that my students at Rutgers are better now 15 years later than when I started teaching them. Um, they have gotten better and better, and it, everything has gotten better, more or less. Pretty similarly with our graduate students. Each year, it's just harder and harder, tougher and tougher. You know, you used to have 200 people trying to get in, then you have 300 people get in, then you have 400 people get in, and it's a global pool. So it is certainly getting harder and harder and harder the students seem to be getting better and better and better, at least in terms of the kinds of things I'm looking for. Now, are I'll say you, one more thing about you. Can work as hard these days? And you see any compared? To My the students system? are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they're but, but I have, look, this is self-selection. I have a reputation. So people don't come into my classes unless they're prepared to work at I'm sure there's a lot of people on there who aren't working hard at all, but I, I don't actually see them. I will say this, when you talk about cross-cultural, I'm always leery about making any kind of cross-cultural comparisons, but I will, I will go out on a limb and say the following. Right now, the Chinese fall behind us in certain areas because they don't have the creativity. Because they don't question authority, which is the number one thing I want my students to do. They're really smart. They're certainly as smart as us and more. They're very, very smart, and they work really, really hard. But when the Chinese students come to my classes, they want me to be the master. They want me to sit there and give them truths. And it isn't my business to give them truths. It's my business to open up their heads so they can figure out how to think for themselves. And they come from a culture that's always been top-down, authority-down. What we say is what's right. And so they just want to soak up whatever you tell them. So as of now, I expect this to change, actually, pretty soon. Uh, the U.S. still has a huge advantage over many cultures in innovation and creativity because it's not all everybody teaching the exact same way lots of us. But I do see that changing already. I expect it to change in a big way in the next 15 years. Time for one more question if anyone has them. Otherwise, you can all go home. Last question from John. Just change your pace. How long has it been since you've made a presentation like this in a coat and tie? <laughs> <laughs> I never. <laughs> I did this for you. <laughs> I knew it. Dr. Temkin and I were both, uh, we both have diplomas from Princeton. And when Princeton talks about their influential alumni, they mention him, they, they'll mention him. <laughs> tonight, and we have a small uh, present for you from Kincaid. Oh. Uh, thank you for coming down. It should be a t-shirt. A t-shirt. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, you so really much. Uh, we, we, are, we are really blessed here to have some um, outstanding uh, fellowships uh, where we bring in uh, the best people in the world to come, to come talk to our students. And, and you saw one tonight. Our students heard one today, and uh, thank you again for opening up our minds and helping our students think and helping us here think. So, well, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure to be here. I actually, since he asked this question, I got to undress for all of you. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll see why. This is my normal 
t-shirt for lecturing if I talk about anything at all like this. You're not going to really be able to see this, but can you see it? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much.